Hi, this is Matt at OSAT Lab, and today's lesson is on weakened questions in the logical reasoning section. Now, weakened questions are a fairly common question type. 9% of all logical reasoning questions are weakened questions. And any improvement you make here will also pay off when you're dealing with strength and, and paradox questions as well. So the skills in this lesson are really important, not just for this question type, but for a few question types that all have very similar lines of reasoning. In this lesson, we're going to look at four things how to spot a weakened question, what the process is for approaching one. And during the course of that process, there are a couple of steps that need a little bit further explanation. So when we go to evaluate arguments, we're going to need reasoning structures. So that's how, how does the argument like built? And then we're going to need trap answer patterns when we're going to eliminate wrong answer choices. And so we'll make sure to cover both of those things specifically. The way you identify that you're on a weakened question is in the language of the question stem itself. The question stem is what sets the question type. So we're looking for language that suggests that we're being asked to weaken the argument. And in this case, which one of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the argument above? Well, the language that says most weakens is the clue that we're looking at a weakened question. And that word most is a really common word and it becomes important because what we're looking for is the answer that's going to have the strongest impact, the one that actually weakens the argument the most. Answer choices that are too weak can often get themselves into trouble. And we're going to see that as we look at some of the trap answer patterns. In this example, which one of the following, if true, casts the most doubt on the argument above? Well, casting doubt represents calling it into question or weakening it. So that would tell us that we're looking at a weakened question here. In this example, which one of the following, if true, most seriously undermines the argument above? And it's the words most undermines that tells us that we're looking at a weakened question in this one. So we really want to be looking in the question stem for a language that says undermines, weakens, casts doubt on. Those are common language cues that tell us that we're looking at a weakened question. Now, the process that you want to use when approaching a weakened question is going to be the same process as that you use whenever you're working on any question in the assumption family. So whether that be a sufficient assumption question or a necessary assumption question, a flaw question, a strengthened question, all of these question types rely on the same process because they're measuring the same thing. They're measuring our ability to evaluate arguments from slightly different perspectives. The first step that you want to take when working on one of these questions is to find the conclusion of the argument. It will always be there. It's really important to find that conclusion because that's what we're judging. Then you need to find the evidence for why it's true. And the evidence will always be such that they don't quite prove the conclusion. And when we go to evaluate arguments, what we're looking for is the space between the evidence and the conclusion. Which that means is that we're going to concede the evidence. We're going to grant that the evidence is true. But what we'll ask is whether or not the conclusion has to be true even if the evidence is, right? So we're going to concede the evidence, challenge the conclusion, and that is essentially evaluating the argument. If we can come up with a reason why the conclusion doesn't have to be true, even though the evidence is, then we can judge the argument as being bad and use that understanding to identify the gap in the reasoning, use that gap to anticipate what the answer could sound like, and then work through the answer choices, either going to try to pair up that anticipation with an answer choice or use trap answer patterns to get rid of wrong answer choices. So the reasoning structure we need to pay most attention to on weakened questions is comparison. Comparisons typically work either by comparing two different things at a point in time, let's say the population of city A versus the population of city B. Or it'll work by comparing a thing at two different points in time. So let's say the population of city A 10 years ago versus the population of city A today. If we can identify these comparisons within the reasoning structure, within the argument itself, it'll give us a better chance at finding what the gap in the argument looks like. Then we can use that gap to anticipate what an answer would sound like and go through the choices. So uh, in this example, we're going to go ahead and see how a comparison can play out. Go ahead and give this question a try. See if you can find an answer that you like. And when you're ready to continue, go ahead and play again, and we'll work it through together. All right, welcome back. So in this question, we have uh, an argument. And we're trying to figure out what's the conclusion. So remember, step one is find that conclusion. We're going to look for language indicators, words along the way that help us identify conclusions. One of the language cues that we want to learn is the word but. It's a pivot. Pivots don't help us identify conclusions, but they do help us identify the argument that's being presented, separating the author's point, in this case, the travel industry consultant, versus an opposing point, 
So whatever the other airlines might be doing. Right? That word but tells us that we're moving away from an opposing argument and towards the author's argument. And within the author's argument is where we're expecting to find the conclusion. As we keep going a little bit further, we see this word because. Now because gives us evidence. So the evidence is that those travelers purchase 80% of all airline tickets. Well, who are those travelers? Right? They're, they're referring back to this previous group. Who are the previous group? Well, the leisure travelers right before the word because. So we know that the last clause is a premise. And if we keep looking, we might even see this word should. They should. Right? They should instead focus on the comfort of leisure travel. Right? That's a recommendation. And when you see the word should, it's a pretty good bet that that's going to be the conclusion. Not guaranteed because you might have more than one claim with the word should. But if none of the other claims have the word should, it's really common that that is the conclusion. It's a recommendation. So the conclusion of the argument is that they should instead focus on the comfort of leisure travelers. Well, who are they? Well, they is referring back to the previous clause where we're talking about airlines. So notice that semicolon in the middle of that sentence. That tells us that there's a relationship between the two statements. So what comes before the semicolon and what comes after it, they're related to each other. But if we think about the meaning of each statement, it's not like that one supports the other. In fact, it's more of a, we're doing too much of this and not enough of that, or the airlines are over-concerned about the comfort of passengers flying on business and should be focusing more on the comfort of leisure travelers. So the whole thing represents the conclusion. And so why are they saying that airlines should be focused more on leisure travelers? Well, remember, leisure travelers book 80% of all airline tickets, right? So if you think about a, a map on an airplane, we know that the first few rows are safe for business class, the back of the plane is safe for, uh, for the main cabin, right? And there's a lot more seats in the back area than in the front area, right? So 80% of tickets are being sold in the main cabin. Only 20% of tickets are being sold uh, in business class. So what's the stuff before the word but doing in this case? Well, several airlines are increasing elbow room and leg room in business class because surveys show that business travelers value additional space more than, say, better meals. And hopefully, as we read through that, that word because catches your attention. It gives us an organizational relationship between the uh, the two ideas in the first sentence. So that what comes after the word because is the evidence for why what came before it is true. We actually have an, a, an opposing argument here with an opposing premise and an opposing conclusion. So now that we have the argument dissected, we need to figure out what's what's wrong with it. We need to evaluate it. We, every single argument in the assumption family is going to be invalid. It means the conclusion will not follow from the evidence. And if we can figure out why, then we'll have the, the key to finding the right answer. So why might it be the case that this advice that the travel industry consultant is giving may not be the best? Is it possible for some way or another that actually it is a good idea to be focused on the business travelers? So let's take this example here where we've got 10 tickets being sold in business class and 40 tickets being sold in the main cabin. Okay. That's 80% of all tickets being sold to, to leisure travelers. But does that really mean that we should be focused on them? If we think about it from the perspective of an airline, right? this is an, a recommendation for what the airline should be doing. So we probably want to think about it from their perspective. Right? Airlines are designed to make money. Does focusing on uh, the leisure travelers make financial sense? Maybe. There's a lot more of them, but maybe not. And if we can come up with a way in which it doesn't make financial sense or sense for some other reason, right, that's all we need to undermine this argument. Since the main goal of, of most companies is to make money, right, we might consider that helping the most number of people may not be the airline's objective, their goal. Right? They may have another goal in mind. If the goal was to help as many people as possible, then maybe we would want the airlines to be focused on uh, better serving the leisure travelers. But if the airline's goal isn't to help the most number of people as possible, and maybe instead is to um, maximize profits, then we may be making a different decision. It kind of depends. Right now, we have no way of knowing where more revenue or more profit is coming from. Is is there more profit coming from the business class travelers? Or is there more profit coming from the main cabin travelers? We don't actually know. Um, and if the tickets for business class are very, very, very expensive, let's say 
five thousand dollars, whereas the uh, tickets for the uh, leisure travelers are more like a hundred dollars. Right? Then we could imagine a scenario in which the revenue coming in off the business class cap part of the cabin actually brings in more money than the revenue coming in off of the main cabin. Right? This might be a little extreme, but it's definitely within the world of possible. And if this were true, then maybe we would want to be focused on providing the best possible service for those business class travelers. It might be a lot easier to, to provide world-famous service for 10 people than it is to provide world-class service for uh, 40. So now that we understand that there might be a financial incentive to be focused on the business class travelers, we should be able to undermine this argument simply by saying something along the lines of, yeah, if the revenue coming in off the business uh, part of the cabin is greater than the revenue coming off the main part of the cabin, then the recommendation that airlines should be focused on leisure travelers may not be a good one. Now let's go to the answer choices and take a look. Answer choice A says that business travelers often make travel decisions based on whether they feel given airline values to business. So this does seem to suggest that the business travelers might be pissed if the if the quality of the service goes down, right? They're looking to make sure that um, they're well taken care of. And if we're not taking care of them or the airlines are not, maybe they'll go somewhere else. This could call into question the conclusion, but the problem with it is it is not quite strong enough. There's a couple of places of weakness here. First off, if we look at the beginning of the industry, it says that business travelers often make travel decisions. So how often is often? A few times, a couple of times. The minimum associated with often isn't very high. It's like a sum statement. So just because some business travelers make such decisions doesn't mean that this is going to be enough of them for us to be really focused on them. And then, you know, secondarily, just because they're going to make decisions based on whether they feel that a given airline values their business, like, they may still feel that way even if the airline is focused on giving better experiences for leisure travelers, right? They may already meet that minimum threshold that uh, business travelers need, and any additional effort should actually maybe go into the leisure travelers. So there's a weakness here in, in answer choice A that um, we can use to get rid of it. Answer choice B says that some airlines have indicated that they will undertake alterations in the seating space throughout the entire passenger area of their planes in the near future. So there's a couple of things going on with this answer choice, but the first thing is that it's talking about these alterations being made throughout the entire passenger area. The conclusion was to pay less attention to the business class people and more, uh, more attention to the, the leisure travelers. Maybe that's what's happening in this answer choice, uh, or maybe not. Like, it could be the case that uh, if they're making alterations, that they're going to reduce the quality of care for the leisure travelers and increase the quality of care for the business travelers. Um, but it could be the other way around. And without knowing that, we can't really use this, this answer choice to uh, undermine the conclusion because it could be making changes in a way that is exactly in line with the conclusion. So we're going to call this one too weak. Let's get rid of answer choice B. Answer choice C says that sleeping in comfort during long flights is not the primary concern of leisure travelers. Well, it's not the primary concern of leisure travelers, but it may still be a very important consideration. Furthermore, um, sleeping in comfort is not necessarily the same as the comfort of leisure travelers in general. And it may be the case that answer choice C is simply talking about just one aspect of comfort, whereas the argument is talking about focusing on the comfort of leisure travelers in general. But the, the bigger point is that this we're not talking about a primary concern, or even if it's not the primary concern, it may still be a very major concern. Um, and so this would not weaken the argument. Answer choice D says that a far greater proportion of an airline's revenues is derived from business travelers than from leisure travelers. This kind of gives us a reason to think that the business travelers are maybe really important. Maybe we shouldn't be focused on the leisure travelers since a far greater proportion of revenues is coming from the business travelers. Suggests that maybe we should be actually focused on the business travelers. And this 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 seems to provide a, um, a reason to undermine the argument. Notice that this answer is comparing business travelers with leisure travelers and giving us a way to judge the relative significance of something uh, for both. This is the only answer choice that compares business travelers with leisure travelers. And notice that the nature of the answer choice itself is a comparison. Just like the argument is focused on comparing where the airlines should be focused, answer choice D is um, comparing the relative significance of each of these two uh, travel groups uh, in proportion to the airline's revenues. 
So this looks like a good contender. Let's hold on to D. Answer choice E says that most leisure travelers buy airline tickets only when fares are discounted. So the beginning of this answer choice is not terrible. It's actually stronger than some of the other answer choices. Most leisure travelers, not all, but definitely most, they buy airline tickets only when fares are discounted. Uh, the, the question that pops into my mind is why? Why are they buying tickets only when fares are discounted? If they're buying fares at discounted prices because they don't care about comfort, they just want to get from point A to point B, and the most important thing is to them is price, then that would undermine the argument to, rec- to, to focus on providing more comfort for these leisure travelers. But if it turns out that the reason why leisure travelers aren't willing to spend money on, um, on flights is because the seats themselves are very, very uncomfortable, that actually maybe indicates that there's a possibility we could increase or the airlines could increase the comfort of the of those seats. And maybe that would actually be really good for their bottom line. They could charge more money. The leisure travelers would now charge, uh, pay more money because they finally have a decent seat. Because it could go either way, answer choice E is simply too weak to impact the argument. And so that leaves us with answer choice D as the right answer. So let's look at another example. And this one is going to involve causation. Causation is a very important reasoning structure when it comes to weakening questions uh, and strengthening questions and paradox questions. So causation is going to be uh, really important that you understand. Causation is a, a very strong type of relationship. Um, a causes B. Causation is really hard to prove. Right? You can get pretty close to um, statistical significance and correlate two events as being so closely connected that it's likely that one of them caused the other. But um, it's going to be really hard to prove causation on the LSAT. And so you want to look out for conclusions that deal with causal relationships because when they start asserting co- uh, a causal conclusion, that's a really good opportunity to attack the argument. And when, when you go to weaken an argument that involves a causal conclusion, we're going to resort to some pretty tried and true tactics. The idea of providing an alternative cause, right? So that if maybe it's something else that is causing the thing to occur or provide an example of the presumed cause without the presumed effect. So if we can find an example of the causal relationship, what's the presumed cause and what's the presumed effect, and then find those terms in another situation where we have the cause occurring, but the effect is not occurring, that weakens the idea that this thing causes that thing to occur. And if we can find an example of uh, having the effect without the cause, that would do the same. So we're either going to be trying to attack the correlation between the two events or we'll be uh, looking to provide an alternative cause um, in the right answer. So here's another example. Uh, Give this one a try on your own. Hit pause. And when you're ready to work this one through together, hit play again and we'll do it together. All right. Welcome back. So in this one, we're looking for the conclusion again. Remember, the first step in our process when we're working on weakened questions is to find the conclusion of the argument. But as we look through this argument, one of the first structures that we see is this idea of first, second, and third. So we know that the, um, these last three sentences, the, the nature of the way in which they begin suggests that these are not supporting each other. So what that means, the last three sentences are premises. So the conclusion has got to be somewhere above that. If we look at the sentence right before, we see this word however, and that however is very much like a pivot. It's harder to spot in this one because it doesn't begin the sentence. It's kind of crammed into the middle. But however is the pivot. It tells us that we're moving it away from an opposing point and towards the author's point. We've got two sentences here, the, the claim that comes before the word however and the claim that comes after. Well, because we know that however is pivoting towards the author's view, we know that the second sentence here is the conclusion of the argument and that the first sentence before that is the opposing point. In some countries, certain produce is routinely irradiated with gamma rays in order to extend shelf life. That's what others are doing. This one says that there are good reasons to avoid irradiated food. It's it's bad. Stay away from it. So if we look at the conclusion, there are good reasons to avoid irradiated foods, does that follow from the evidence that the irradiated foods are exposed to radioactive substances that produce the gamma rays, Irradiation can reduce the vitamin content of fresh foods, leaving behind harmful chemical residues. And finally, that irradiation spawns unique radiolytic products that cause serious health problems, including cancer. In this case, there is causation in the evidence. 
So it's not like they're mistaking a correlation for cause and effect relationship. If we look at that third point, irradiation spawns unique radiolytic products that cause serious health problems. Right? There's a causal relationship in that premise. If we look at um, the first one, they are exposed to the radioactive substances that produce the gamma rays, right? So the radioactive substances produce gamma rays, and these foads are being exposed to them. There is definitely a causal nature in there. Second, irradiation can reduce the vitamin content of fresh foods, leaving behind harmful chemical residues. Um, can reduce, suggest a causal relationship, that it has the power to impact it. So the evidence already involves some nature of causation. And the conclusion is basically saying, yeah, that stuff is all real bad, right? There are good reasons to avoid irradiated foods. Irradiated foods will do those things to you. Right? Um, to weaken this argument, if we could find something else that was causing the bad things to happen, if we could find irradiated foods that weren't bad for you, or if we could find foods that were bad for you but that weren't irradiated, maybe that would work as well. So we want to be thinking about alternative cause, cause without effect, and effect without cause. What's strange in this question is that four of the answer choices are going to weaken the argument. We see more accept questions in strengthen and weaken in paradox, particularly in paradox questions, because there's a wide range of ways in which you could impact the argument. Because they're asking for most weakens or most supports, or because they're asking for most weakens the argument, there's lots of ways you could weaken an argument. That's going to create more opportunities, make it a little bit harder to predict what the right answer is going to say, leading to more accept questions within this particular question type. So the question stem says that each of the following if true weakens the consumer advocate's argument except. That means that four of these answer choices are gonna weaken the consumer advocate's argument. The one that doesn't is our answer. Answer choice A says that unique radiolytic products have seldom been found in any irradiated food. So we have these radiolytic products and they're seldom found in any irradiated food. So we've got the, the cause present, the radiated food, right? but we don't have the effect, which is these uh, radiolytic uh, products. Cause without effect, let's get rid of answer choice A. This is actually going to weaken the argument. Answer choice B says that cancer and other serious health problems have many causes that are unrelated to radioactive substance and gamma rays. Well, cancer has many causes that are unrelated to radioactive substances. At first glance, this looks like this might be weakening the argument by maybe bringing up possible alternative causes. But but when you bring up an alternative cause, it should be a replacement to the one that was being suggested. It shouldn't be an additional one. And so B, while it is bringing up other things that cause cancer, it's not saying that they might be the real cause and it's not a radiation. The answer choice B is suggesting that, that there are things unrelated to radioactive substances that cause cancer. So this does bring up alternative cause. But it doesn't. It's not strong enough to rule out the fact that irradiated food also causes cancer. Right? These are other things that are causing cancer. But saying that other things cause cancer doesn't actually go so far as saying that this doesn't. So this one feels a little weak. Let's hold on to answer choice B. Answer choice C says that a study showed that irradiation leaves the vitamin content of virtually all fruits and vegetables unchanged. So a really important characteristic of this answer choice is the degree. By being strong enough to be discussing all fruits and vegetables, that's more than what you need to be describing fresh foods, right? So the, the scope of answer choice C is big enough. It undermines the second point in the argument. And so well, let's go ahead and get rid of answer choice C. Answer choice D says that the amount of harmful chemicals found in irradiated foods is less than the amount that occurs naturally in most kinds of foods. So D is actually undermining the argument as well. It's saying that these harmful chemicals really, well, there's not that many of them, right? So even if they're there, it's less than what we're typically exposed to, making it less likely that we should be avoiding irradiation because the negative things that it's spinning off aren't very significant. There's not much of them. This weakens the argument. Let's go ahead and get rid of D. E says that a study showed that the cancer rate is no higher among people who eat irradiated food than among those who do not. So if, if irradiated food was really causing problems, we would expect it to be higher for those people, but it's not. This is like cause without effect. Let's go ahead and get rid of answer choice E. It weakens the argument. And um, that leaves us with answer choice B is the right answer. On weakened questions, it's actually a really common characteristic that the right answer is new information, something that wasn't involved in the argument, right? Because we're looking to have that impact. So you want to give a little bit more consideration to answer choices that you think might be out of scope. Don't maybe a little less hasty to get rid of them and think about whether or not they might be relevant in some way that you didn't consider initially. 
And then when it comes to logic, we want to look out for answer choices that are doing the opposite of what we want. So if we're being asked to weaken the argument, look out for answer choices that are going to strengthen the argument. And that's going to be more tempting because they're relevant. It's going to use the right kinds of words, but it'll be wrong because it's moving the wrong argument in the wrong direction. Irrelevant relationships are ones in which the answer choice builds um, a comparison when we're dealing with conditional logic or a causation when we're dealing with conditional logic. When, whenever you see a, a switch in the reasoning structure in the answer choice, that's a, a good sign that you might be dealing with an irrelevant relationship. Or if the answer is just building um, a relationship between two randomly grabbed terms from within the argument, like they're there, so they're, it's not going to be out of scope. It'll be a little harder to get rid of it. But that particular relationship may not have any impact on the argument. Term shifts are when the, the when when one of the terms has been tweaked in such a way that it's no longer quite good enough. Maybe it's too weak now. So before we were talking about um, all fruits and vegetables, now we're talking about um, fresh fruits and vegetables. So is there an overlap? Like look out for them to potentially uh, shift the the term and make it such that they're either talking about something. Um, too small in the answer choice or maybe too big in the in the stimulus right and then when it comes to degree you want to be on the lookout for answers that are simply too weak right stronger is going to be preferred to weaker when on when you're on weakened questions um, look out for areas of weakness within the choice because those will be ways in which you can make quicker eliminations don't start by eliminating answer choices that are wrong because of degree i would definitely start by trying to get rid of anything that's out of scope first and kind of working my way from left to right using scope first, then logic, and then degree. I find that if you just eliminate based off a of degree on that first pass, it really should be more of a tiebreaker than, um, than an absolute rule. So in summary for this lesson, you spot a weakened question with language in the question stem that gives you something like weakens, undermines, calls into question, casts doubt, and then be on the lookout for those accept questions because you're going to see a lot of them. The reasoning structures... In terms of their frequency, uh, conditional logic almost entirely disappears when you're working on weakened questions, and primarily you're dealing with um, comparison and causation. The trap answers you want to be on the lookout for, out of scope, those that do the opposite are strengthening the argument, those that aren't having enough impact, so they're too weak to impact the argument, and then irrelevant relationships and term shifting. So that's it for today's lesson on weakened questions. I invite you to check out these other lessons or visit us today at lsatlab.com.